This is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News. On July 9th, New York Magazine published a grim assessment of humanity's future. The lengthy article authored by David Wallace Wells was entitled, The Uninhabitable Earth. The article began with these ominous words. It is, I promise, worse than you think. If your anxiety about global warming is dominated by fears of sea level rise, you are barely scratching the surface of what terrors are possible, even within the lifetime of a teenager today. Absent a significant adjustment to how billions of humans conduct their lives, parts of the earth will likely become close to uninhabitable and other parts horrifically inhospitable as soon as the end of this century. So how bad is it really? Now here to unpack this dire assessment of humanity's future is Professor Michael Mann. Professor Mann, a frequent guest on The Real News, is a distinguished research professor and a director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. He's the author of the book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, and his latest book co-authored with Tom Tolles is titled The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Nile is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics and Driving Us Crazy. Thank you again for joining us, Professor Mann. Uh, thank you, it's good to be with you. So according to David Wallace Wells, uh, his piece in New York Magazine was based on, and I'm quoting him, dozens of interviews and exchanges with climatologists and researchers in related fields and reflects hundreds of scientific papers on the subject of climate change. And Wallace Wells went on and said that his piece uh, is a portrait of our best understanding of where the planet is heading absent aggressive action. Uh, however, you've written a somewhat critical response to this article. And your, your critique of the Wallace Wells piece in uh, New York Magazine can, I think, be broken down into two themes. The, the, the first, broadly speaking, is about factual errors that you've identified within the article. And the second relates to the rather pessimistic tone of uh, his article. I'd like to start with the factual errors. What do you consider to be the, the most important factual errors in this New York Magazine piece? Yeah, and I don't see those two things as necessarily being independent because my uh, assessment is that those factual errors all sort of were in the same direction of implying a, uh, a narrative of uh, a future climate that is worse than what the science objectively supports. Um, and as I've said, the, the truth is bad enough. We, we don't have to exaggerate it to make the case that, uh, you know, that there is a great urgency in acting on climate change. So some of the specific errors uh, were, his miscitation uh, of uh, one, uh, a single study um, that simply demonstrated that one data set that had showed less warming than all the other data sets um, was an error. And when it was fixed, uh, it actually showed the same warming as the other data sets. And so he described that study as showing that the Earth is warming twice as fast as we thought. And that's simply not the case. It, it only showed that the one flawed data set that was underestimating the warming uh, was in line with the other data sets. Um, and moreover, the warming that we're seeing is in line with what climate models have projected we're likely to see as we continue to burn fossil fuels and increase greenhouse gas concentrations. So that's a case where, uh, again, the, the error um, was used to sort of uh, help uh, motivate a, um, a, a narrative, a, a somewhat uh, you know, overly uh, doomist uh, narrative. Uh, mm -hmm. The same thing is true in his assessment of so-called uh, carbon cycle feedbacks. What do I mean? Uh, there is um, methane that's trapped in the permafrost, and as the earth warms up, some of that methane uh, is likely to be released. And since methane itself is a greenhouse gas, a potent greenhouse gas, that can further increase the warming. It's what we call a positive feedback, which might sound good, but it's bad. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. It adds to the warming. Uh, but in his piece, he sort of quoted, he cited um, uh, uh, a really fringe viewpoint that argues that there's so much of this methane out there that could be readily mobilized that it could double the amount of warming uh, that we're likely to see in the decades ahead. And that just is not uh, objectively supported by the science. Um, the objective science uh, that's out there suggests that, yes, this stuff exists, and some of it will be released. But the main driver of warming in the foreseeable future is going to be the CO2 buildup from our burning of fossil fuels. Um, and there are other errors. There was a panel of uh, 14 uh, leading climate scientists who evaluated the article for accuracy. 
for uh, the site Climate Feedback, which is sort of a watchdog independent site that evaluates the, uh, the, the, the scientific merit of uh, articles on climate change. And the overall score was, was a, a, negative, uh, a negative 0.8, which is, um, you know, which is very low uh, on the accuracy scale. It was judged as being um, somewhat inaccurate as an article. Now, that alone uh, is not necessarily, um, you know, a problem um, if the errors are honest ones and, and they're sort of, you know, uh, act to sometimes make things sound worse, sometimes make them sound better. But the errors uh, all were in the same direction of implying, uh, again, a narrative of uh, a far gloomier uh, future than um, the one that we would likely see. Um, and the one we'd likely see is still a bad future. If we don't act on this problem now, we're going to see a lot of bad things happen, and a lot of bad things are already happening. But he sort of took what was an absolute worst-case scenario and made it seem like it was a probable scenario. And my worry is that when you do that and you make it sound like you know, this is an unsolvable problem and there's nothing we can do to prevent this disastrous future, it actually leads us in the same direction as outright denial of climate change. It leads us down a path of inaction. Right. So it, because people sort of adopt a fatalistic attitude and they say there's nothing yeah. we can do about it at this stage. So, well, yeah. I, I just to play devil's advocate for a moment, and I, I certainly appreciate your point uh, two, two points that you made amongst others, and one of them being that it's it's difficult to uh, disentangle the factual errors from the pessimistic tone, uh, and also that we have to be, it's imperative that we be faithful to the science, and I readily accept both of those points. But one might also argue, giving, taking those points as a given, that the whole reason why we find ourselves in this mess is that we have suffered both as a species and certainly at a governmental level from a, an appalling degree of complacency. Isn't there something to be said for highlighting, placing greater emphasis on worst case scenarios, ones that are supported by the science, but highlighting the worst case scenarios, try to light a fire under policymakers and get them to act with the requisite degree of urgency. Yeah, and, and let me state, by the way, that th this article, you know, it, it was not an egregious example of the phenomenon, um, but it was a very widely publicized example. And that's why, you know, I felt I had to weigh in. Um, and so the author, you know, uh, uh, who's, a, who's a good author, and, I, and I'm, you know, uh, a, a good writer and has a history of doing really good journalism, and, and I think, you know, sort of uh, bought into a, a misframing in this particular case. Um, uh, but it, it's really a, a far more moderate example of a narrative that one does find out there, which is extremely unhelpful. Um, from folks like uh, Guy McPherson, who's an ecologist, he's become sort of a cult hero um, to the doomist uh, crowd. And my understanding is that um, he had some influence on this article. Um, the author talked with McPherson. McPherson has argued that uh, all life on Earth will be destroyed within 10 years, and there's nothing we can do about it because of exponential climate change um, that has no basis uh, at all in scientific fact. And in, fa it, it, with, in, in the case of McPherson, he literally is arguing there's nothing we can do, folks. Um, and, and, and his prescription is no different from the prescription of fossil fuel industry funded climate change deniers who say there's no reason to act. Um, in, in the case of the New York Magazine article, not nearly that egregious. And, and I do agree uh, with much of what you've said. And, and I think there's sort of a fine line there. We do need to talk about worst case scenarios. And I've written articles about how it's important to look at what we call the fat tail. If you look at the probability distribution of impacts, uh, it doesn't drop off to zero when you go to very large impacts. It, 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 it drops off very slowly. And that means there's a small but finite probability of changes that are far worse than what we are currently projecting with state-of-the-art climate models. Um, and that has to be taken into account. You have to take into account the fat tail of risk um, when you do sort of the cost-benefit analysis of acting on this problem. Uh, it's similar to why we buy uh, fire insurance for our homes. Not because we think our home burning down is a likely scenario. It's because if our homes did burn down, even though it's un, uh, an unlikely scenario, it would be so catastrophic that it makes sense to hedge against that 
low probability, high cost scenario by investing now in fire insurance. And arguably, uh, those sort of um, worst case scenarios can play a similar role in informing uh, our you know, mitigation of climate change as a planetary insurance policy. So I support you know, the, 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 that framing, uh, the, the framing that does talk about worst case scenarios and the impact that they should have on our assessment of risk. That having been said, my main criticism was that it seemed to equate at times what was in fact a, a worst case scenario with a likely scenario. And in fact, the likely scenario, as far as many are concerned, is that uh, first of all, you know, just looking at the data, carbon emissions have actually plateaued now. They're not following that uh, up, ever upward trajectory that we were on five or 10 years ago. So a most likely scenario of the future is not a scenario where we burn all of the available fossil fuels. It's pretty clear that is not the pathway that we are now on. Um, and so, you know, the fact is that there is a great urgency to this problem, and we do have to bring down our carbon emissions rapidly. Plateauing isn't enough. We've got to bring them down to zero or near zero by the middle of this century if we're going to avoid the worst impacts on climate. Um, but there is a path for doing that. Um, there's a very real path forward for doing that in the wake of the Paris Agreement um, and the commitments that were made by uh, the, the nations of the world to act on this problem. There is a very clear path forward for uh, averting catastrophic climate change. And it's very important that we don't tell people otherwise, because that leads to despair. And ultimately, uh, it can become a reason for inaction. I want to focus in just a push forward with this theme a little further on a particular passage from his article. He says, the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, and these are the reports that are widely considered to be the gold standard of climate science, uh, don't fully account for the albedo effect. Uh, and in parentheses, he says, less ice means less reflected and more absorbed sunlight, hence more warming. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, account for more cloud cover, which traps heat, or the dieback of forests and other flora, which extract carbon from the atmosphere. Each of these promises to accelerate warming, and the history of the planet shows that the temperature sh can shift as much as five degrees Celsius within 13 years. Fr from a scientific perspective, do you agree with this commentary about the IPC re C reports and its implications? And if no, so, I, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that whole passage, unfortunately, is riddled with some inaccuracies. First of all, the five degrees Celsius um, uh, change in temperature he's referring to was local. It was um, uh, associated with an event known as the Younger Dryas event, which was largely localized in the North Atlantic. Um, there's no evidence that there was a five degrees Celsius uh, change in global temperature. So um, this is a common problem of equating regional changes in climate that can often be quite large with global scale changes. So, so that's not accurate. But the, the larger point, um, uh, the, the, the one that you're asking about, um, is uh, whether or not uh, the, um, you know, the IPCC um, has neglected um, key sort of processes that are relevant to climate change. And, and that's not true. Um, the, the, the claims that he made that it's not representing the, the, the carbon cycle and the role of, um, of vegetation uh, and that it's not representing the, the loss of the reflective property of ice as ice is melted away, that's simply not true. Those processes are very much in the models. Now, there's a grain of truth to his criticism, and my sense is that he took what was um, uh, sort of legitimate criticism and didn't get it quite right when he translated it. A legitimate criticism is that the models um, are not fully capturing those processes. They're not fully capturing some of the processes related to the carbon cycle and vegetation and ocean uh, biological uh, behavior. There are all these interactions between life um, and the climate that are important to take a hold of. To, to, to take account of. And um, not all climate models do a very good job in accounting for the, those so-called interactions between the climate and the carbon cycle. And I think he's alluding to that. But they, they do account for them in general, just not perfectly. A lot of the representations are imperfect, and that's a legitimate uh, a place for uh, criticism. Uh, with regard to the melt of ice, um, they very much take into account 
the melting of ice and the lowering of this albedo effect that comes with that. That's another positive feedback, not a good thing. It means an amplifying feedback that accelerates the warming. Um, but the, that, that is in the models. What is true is that the models are not quite capturing the rate at which we are seeing Arctic sea ice uh, melt away. And there's some interesting discussions within the scientific community about that, why, why that might be uh, the case. And they do not yet uh, properly account for the loss of ice from the ice sheets, because it's very difficult to run a climate model in real time and have it coupled to a model of the continental ice sheets, which are um, just modeling those mathematically is a very um, uh, expensive, computationally expensive process. And so it's very difficult to run a model, over, you know, project over the next hundred years with a climate model that has an interactive carbon cycle and an interactive uh, ice sheet representation. So what that means is that those uh, sorts of contributions, the role of the ice sheets, often has to be represented in a somewhat approximate way. And it's possible that we are um, underestimating the, the contribution that the melting uh, from ice sheets could make over the next century or two. There is a legitimate point to be made there that the models are not fully capturing those processes. But it, it's wrong to say the models are ignoring them, as if we know these things exist and we've just decided not to account for them. Modelers are accounting for them as best they can, but there are legitimate criticisms about whether we're fully uh, accounting for all of the subtleties associated with these processes. Well, you've identified, and lastly, I'd, I'd just ask you, like to ask you this about this article. I mean, you've identified some quite significant uh, factual errors and uh, overstatements and so forth. And uh, you've talked about the 14 climate scientists giving a rather uh, negative assessment of the accuracy of the article. Has New York Magazine issued any kind of a correction of the article? Um, not to my knowledge. I think they did say um, they solicited a letter um, from me that they were going to publish a series of commentaries or letters. Um, and then I heard back from them that they weren't going to do that. Instead, they were going to publish a summary of some of the critiques. So I do think that's forthcoming. Um, uh, I, you know, still view New York Magazine as one of our finest publications. And this journalist, um, is an excellent journalist. Um, we, we all, you know, <laughs> you know, all, all, all of us, um, you know, at, at times uh, make mistakes and um, and and don't do our best. And I think this is just an example of where there was a lost opportunity. Um, that with a little bit of additional vetting, uh, uh, this could have been a, um, you know, I I I think a far. A uh, higher quality article, which would have still had um, an impact on the conversation, but which would have also had the support of the scientific community. And, and that's important because people ultimately do want to know if these scenarios are grounded in good science. And when the scientists, uh, not just me, but my colleagues, come back and say, no, there are these problems. It, it actually does undermine the authority of that article. So it is important to get this stuff right. Right. Well, I, I, I hope that uh, we can take the opportunity following this discussion to talk a little bit about uh, some of the current uh, uh, weather phenomena and climate uh, 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 characteristics that we're seeing in this year and particularly this yeah. summer. Uh, so I'd like to come back in part two and explore that with you. Okay. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Mann, and this is Dimitri Lascaris uh, for The Real News.